Maria, thank you so, so much. And many, many thanks also to Alex and the extraordinary team of the museum here and the MIF. And of course, many, many thanks to Ed Atkins. And please keep a very, very warm welcome to Ed Atkins. Now, and before we begin and start to talk about uh, the work, I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the setup of these interviews. Who, who yeah. are we? Are, are we here? Uh, well, I'm not sure, I guess. Um, this is using the same uh, facial capture software that we have upstairs. Um, every time you turn around, it disappears. So it's this sort of game where I do that, <laughs> then your face. Um, so these are uh, motion capture cameras, 3D cameras, and this is a bit of software called... And it, it likes to have people enunciate very well. It's called face shift, and it means that uh, you can map your expressions onto a 3D avatar. This one's a very simple one that comes free with the software, but I thought it was appropriate that we would just be two little boys for this thing. So, <laughs> but yeah, so it's part of the thing upstairs. Um, yours looks very. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't look at it. I know exactly. <laughs> 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 Now, also, Ed, before we begin, I think you had an announcement had to be made. You have just left Twitter and Instagram. Is that correct? Yes. It's, uh, yeah. Well, um, we were just talking about this because Hanselrick is on on all all medium, uh, all media, all the time, right? That's the the fountainhead. But um, I've just left uh, Instagram and Twitter just because it consumed a lot of my time. I was I was constructing a version of myself that I would sort of try and hone and uh, fashion for, for whatever presumed audience or whatever presumed thing. I don't know, yeah, I, and I just check it all the time. And I search for myself and whatever anyone was saying about me and then sort of get upset about that and yeah. So be better without that for now, I think. Yeah, Flushing the system. It's yeah. what Paul Chant said the other day. It's uh, oh, really? the thing okay. of delinking. We should all learn again to delink. Delink, exactly, yeah. Or relink in a different way, you yeah. know, yeah. Not but LinkedIn. But let's no begin with sense. the beginning, because before we talk about uh, motion capture and uh, the extraordinary process which <coughs> we're in the middle of here, here yes. in Manchester, um, I wanted to begin with the beginning and ask you how it all started. How, how did you come to art? How did art come to you? Because I kind of read that there were lots of things which interested you as a, as a child. It wasn't just art. How, how did it begin? I have to be careful because my mum and brother are here, so they'll probably... Um, <laughs> Correct things, um, and and to try and avoid the kind of uh, any mytholo mythologizing thing, but just um, never being super interested in art per se, but more um, you know drawing a lot and uh, music and and cinema and stuff really were were much more uh, important to me as a as a child and still are really you know art is the thing that affords um, the convening of lots of stuff. But then, obviously, uh, art college is also the only place that kind of where you can sort of do do the lot. You can bring writing and performance and uh, uh, singing or, or or drawing or everything together. So, but yeah, as a as a child, it was it was cinema, re really, I guess, or recording films off telly and animation stuff. Jan Schwenkmeyer was a big feature of our household, um, and grotesquery <laughs> and and actually grotesques. Sorry. <laughs> it's weird, yeah. Anyway, uh, <coughs> so uh, but yeah, that, that, that those things uh, were super important, I think. And but I remember like when we met yeah. for the first time, it was actually a, a fascinating studio visit. We we met you with Julia Peyton Johns, and somehow we were all running late, and then we ended up actually yeah. having the studio visit on the move. <laughs> yeah. we, we met in a, in yeah. a car, and it was a sort of a. I remember Julia hour. feeling particularly sick. <laughs> Of me holding my laptop trying to show yeah, exactly. videos. Yeah, and, and it was uh, a very fascinating studio visit. And you told us about, about Werner Herzog and the importance of, of Werner Herzog. Yeah, yeah, which again actually was something we'd recorded off telly as kids. It was a, a Gire Roth of God, or Dad had recorded it. And there were several chunks of that which were very. There's a, there's a bit where he chops off the head of a dissenting, a mutinous guy who started counting down from 10, I think. And his head's chopped off at about four. And you see the head land in some scrub and carry on counting down. And I remember that very, very vividly. But latterly, Herzog, um, in, in fact, I remember my brother wrote a piece about um, even dwarfs started small. And actually, there's something about the grotesque, there's something about the hubris and the kind of 
the uh, Aguirre particularly, there was something about um, that in nature wasn't some sort of great myth, that nature didn't care, that there was some insentience to it, but that there's still this sort of striving to, to dominate in some way, which started to marry up with ways I was thinking about technology and representation, I suppose, particularly. Um, but Herzog just, just generally as a kind of, as a filmmaker was, particularly his stuff filming the jungle, those jungle films. Because I'd started off making, trying to make videos uh, out of stock stuff, uh, or, uh, and sort of stuff nicked from other films. There was Tarzan footage. And thinking about the jungle, and uh, uh, it was trying to convene this stuff around thinking about high definition. Um, and very particularly about high definition as this thing that was too real, that was sort of too far, that tipped over into something else, which is now, you know, it's so ubiquitous that it doesn't have any, any real import discursively. But also the kind of, the, the high has no limit, so high just keeps, although I saw on a box out there on some monitor was ultra high definition, you know. So you kind of wonder how many, but then, you know, high definition inaugurated standard definition, which didn't exist before, so there's this, that also spoke to a kind of perpetual rolling obsolescence of technology and the constant drive towards some infinite vanishing point of finitude, of, of, of verisimilitude, of things looking exactly like, like life, which is certainly something that kind of, um, or that incapacity to do that, or the point at which it fails, is something that's very prevalent upstairs and, and in the recent work as well. So. And before we talk more about the digital and uh, uh, high definition, maybe a few more things about influences and inspirations. You mentioned Zwangmai, and I went yeah. to see him a couple of years ago and visited uh, his, his studio and his amazing really? yeah. animations. I was kind of wondering what it was about Zwangmai and, and Tex Avery and this kind of caricaturing kind of, y you call it once, Paulus King materially inspired yeah. you. What was it? It's the grotesque stuff. It's the kind of very visceral slapstick punch I mean, Schwenkmeyer's stuff is so conspicuously heavily folied. You know, every sound effect is sort of faked in the studio, or amped up, so every clunking foot thing, all the grotesque sort of slapping of meat and lips. And, um, but, but also very much about just what it, the animation, how uncannily uh, realistic it is, and yet so, but almost too more real than real, because it's sort of, you can feel its meticulous handling, the, the way that the clay moves has this extra material layer added to it than, than just, you know, so a piece of clay in front of you. The animation of it, the anima within it was kind of... And the same, Tex Avery's just full of the most ludicrous kind of violence. <laughs> and, um, uh, and, and again, that kind of punchy cartoon editing, all those Carl Stalling soundtracks, which are really um, super over-the-top, uh, incredible kind of musical accompaniments. So, and, and also every gesture having its own sound. So if someone does that, you know, <laughs> but the whole thing is, uh, everything has its own, and I love that. And I think initially in editing video stuff, there was always this idea of, if, if all of the apparently transparent stuff that goes on in the editing of, of, of montage, say, that if you were to sort of signpost all of those with the same gratuitous kind of cartoon sound, so if you do a cut, it's got a clap, if you do a fade, it's got a sort of swanny whistle or something. Um, that, that actually that would somehow start to elevate the structure of editing as well, that you'd start to feel all the things that are supposed to remain invisible when you watch a film. When you, when you read narrative, you follow montage, you don't notice an, an edit unless you're looking for it. Whereas I was kind of interested in making, uh, making the, bringing those things to the fore, you know. That, that structure was always something really exciting, you know. And also that, yeah, so again with the Schwenkmeyer or Tex Avery stuff is that you're very aware that it's a cartoon, but so it has to work extra hard to be, to be felt, you know, sort of punch. Everything is gratuitous and uh, amplified to a point where it almost, it starts to land again or something, you know. I don't know, I know where I'm going, yeah. No, but it's interesting because it leads also to Grant Morrison because uh, uh, actually when we worked here with Philip Arena on Postman's time, he insisted that we go to Scotland to meet Grant Morrison really? because he was very inspired by Grant Morrison. So wow. we spent a day with Grant Morrison and, and, and <laughs> you told me once that his comic books, particularly The Invisibles, was also hugely in, in important for well you that in terms of narrative. I remember reading that, reading that at college, um, which 
yeah, I mean, there's there's a there's a drug that's used in that in the in the in the comic called Key Twenty Three or Key Twenty Four, which is a drug that changes language into the real thing. So if you inject someone with it, and you, I think in the comic uh, at some point someone presents someone with a bowler hat full of scraps of paper with the word severed finger on them, and just shows it to this person, and they're horrified because this drug actually turns every word into the thing. And it's great, so you can just uh, have a, a word up on a screen and sort of hypnotise someone and they're, they're sort of parallel. I mean, it's used as a torture device in the comic. But his stuff as well, I mean, his, um, there's this really over-the-top, amazing lecture he gives. At, uh, you can watch it on YouTube. It's uh, at DisinfoCon, which is some convention of people talking about the disinformation of the state and all manner of other things. Um, and he talks about how he... Uh, wanted to be abducted by aliens, so he just was. I mean, he speaks in this extraordinary way where everything just comes true. I want this to happen, and, and I was abducted by aliens, and then this happens, and, and basically I create these sigils. I mean, it's this sort of ludicrous uh, pop kind of magic that he performs on himself. But really, it was always about, again, about, about literature, about the possibilities of representation, the possibilities of inducing or conjuring some real, effective, maybe even physical thing. That if you could just get the right coordinates right, if you could have the right sound and image and sort of yelp or something, then something would sort of appear, manifest, either in the viewer or, um, or in space or something. Which sounds too occult, and I don't mean it literally, although, you know, it'd be amazing, you know. And the idea of writing uh, is also something which uh, plays a role in the, in the book here because there's a conversation, a great conversation with you and Adam Thurber yes, about your yeah. connection to literature. Uh, not only Grant Morrison, but other, many other forms of writing, uh, a sort of whole tradition of English writing. Adam thinks there is a link to Gothic novels, to sci-fi novels, to romantic poetry, to the last experimental avant-garde of Anne Quinn and B.S. Johnson. But he particularly evokes J.H. Prynne um, mm. And you then sort of talk about this idea of thickening, that you're particularly interested in thickening in terms of, 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 yeah. of writing. Can you tell us about that and who are the kind of writers who, who inspire you? Uh, thickening, uh, I suppose I was talking about the, uh, a kind of viscosity of words. So words that are very particularly substantive, you know, that you feel them, they both they have their own kind of weird onomatopoeia, but it's not onomatopoeia, so it's not like the sounds like is thing, but more like it feels like the word in your mouth, like gunge or something, which uh, sort of occupies you in your mouth. It's a very oral sensation of, of writing, I think, even though it's you know, predominantly textual at first. Um, they're, they're very definitely a kind of, it's a poetic uh, moment, I suppose. Um, I mean, Jeremy Prynne, as a sort of, um, as a path, is relatively new to me. I mean, it's through, through getting to know particularly a, a poet called Joe Luna down in Brighton, who also introduced me to, to so much stuff, um, so many other poets, particularly a guy called Keston Sutherland, who, whose little chapbook Odes to TL161P is an amazing, um, a, amazing journey through a sort of embodied personal sexual experience of growing up through Thatcherite Britain. <laughs> but that makes it sound too very... Uh, you know, literally that, but it's not. It's occluded by um, a language that is that is almost logorrheic. It's almost just coming. It has to keep coming out. There's a kind of horror vacui about if I stopped talking, then what about I would disappear? So there's this thing, which is what I'm doing now, is to just keep talking and keep talking, filling filling the time and the space, and because the horror of disappearance or something. And um, but he he very he also engages specialist language. Words that we don't know, I mean, TL161P is, I think, is a product code for a refrigerator hinge. But I've always been into, I mean, a lot of uh, those sort of American postmodernists, Donald Barthelm particularly, um, you know, who would just sort of throw in both uh, sort of co contemporary American slang or, or equally Arthurian English or equally um, medical terminology, which, you know, you, you don't understand what it means, but you feel medical terminology, you feel what that, um, ooh, you know, the kind of, that horrible ignorance that you feel maybe when a doctor is talking to you, or something like that, yeah. 
And one of the things uh, which is there from the very beginning in, in your work is the use of high definition video. So there is this background in all kinds of art forms, you <coughs> the connection to music, the connection to literature, mm. your connection to singing, mm. uh, connection to writing. But then at a certain moment, uh, you started to work with high definition video. And I, I remember in our first conversation, and that's something which since then uh, you, you've used more and more, is this <coughs> idea actually of, of uh, uh, bringing in texture, bringing in surface, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about how, what was the beginning of you using high definition video? Was there an epiphany or? Uh, well, more, more vi video was just an epiphany because I think yeah. I've been trying to, at art college, trying to well, m make art, you know, and, um, and uh, but this is, I'm particularly talking about my masters because uh, the BA was a completely different time, but the, the, the masters, I hadn't been making video at all, and I'd been trying to make sort of quite hermetic, very, very boring conceptual art things, you know, that were kind of tied up and, there you go, aren't, aren't I clever? And, and actually, editing video just came about um, fiddling with uh, a computer and, and some old Tarzan films. And, uh, and it, was a, it's a, it was wonderful. It's a wonderful thing, is realising that actually editing, editing video not particularly making video, but editing it, editing footage and fiddling with the nanoseconds of what a cut, all of that stuff was wonderful and totally presented itself so obviously suddenly. Um, and obviously at the, that time, high definition was sort of um, probably, a, this is 2008, I guess, so it's, it's, it's there, it's everywhere, it's in consumer markets, but it's, it's quite prosumer, it's quite a high-end thing. Um, and and I, at the time, I'd been trying to write about um, structural materialist uh, tendencies in, in artists' moving image making and where those things might have gone or where uh, a kind of discussion about moving image in the light of the disappearance of the, the medium itself might go, you know. So what, what happens when there's no film and there's no... There's no, no, not even a DVD. There's just the data haunting various bits of you know, stored on this hard disk or infinitely reproducible. So there's no, there's no body. And, um, and yet at the same time, high definition, the, the finitude of the image, the skin of the thing, it privileges... I remember at the time writing a, a short piece about this Michael Mann film called Public Enemies, which he uses sort of HD camcorders uh, to make. And it's got a sort of... It's amazing that it looks immediately like sort of daytime TV, cheap, amateur... It's always too, it's too real, it's too sort of, um, you can tell, it's sort of plasticky. The guns feel fake. Johnny Depp's face is, is horribly mortal, you know, which is maybe not what you want from a movie, a period movie about gangsters, you know. Um, and I certainly was very interested in that, that drop-off, the kind of, the slump of this stuff from, from you know, movie-dumb into, into something that is actually kind of a bit... Uh, gratuitous, uh, you know, all this stuff about when The Hobbit, the first Hobbit came out and it was filmed at 48 frames per second and at 4K resolution in 3D and all the makeup artists bemoaning the fact that they had to work double the amount of time to make sure the dwarves' noses looked more, because it's so forensic, the camera, and that when they screened it and everyone in the audience was like, I didn't really like it, you know, because it, it's too, too much, it's sort of like watching Am Dram at this distance, you know. Um, which is really interesting. Like, what is that effect? That sort of, and how do we want to re-encounter corporeal thing, experience or something? You know, there is this conversation uh, where you discuss this very point with Katie Guggenheim. Uh, the idea that obviously the public complained about the Hobbit film being too real, and you know, basically saying high definition reality privileges the representation of texture and surface, but at the same time, the body of the film or video has dropped away, even yes. though the image itself is more concerned <coughs> with physical and tactile aspects. The source of the image, the body, is no longer there. And then you bring in André Bazin, the great André Bazin, who commented mm. about cinema being a warning that the material will always return. Can yeah. you tell us about that? And will the material return? And how? Well, I think, I think this, is, this has become increasingly super important to me, is that actually through the technology per se, and from mo moving image onwards, but digital very particularly, is, um, has a kind of danger within it, or a sensation, it's at least ambivalent, about uh, matter, about stuff. It's very good at disappearing things in a kind of puff of um, figuration. You know, that, that the more and more kind of um, perfect the Apple stuff becomes, 
the less we think about the, the kind of narrative or the material realities behind the thing that go on. So when we talk about, I mean, it, you know, this thing about the cloud, obviously it's, it's, a, it's a very perfectly chosen word that actually is quite insidious about the way it, it disappears, the fact that the cloud is actually someone else's computer or is actually just a load of computers uh, all whirring and heavy breathing in a, in a, in a hangar somewhere or something. That, that's Google as well. You know, that, the, that we're, we're kind of constantly um, encountering uh, the digital as an immaterial thing. And then there's this confusion between what should be treated li as literal, as a term, and what should be treated figuratively. As in, you know, immaterial, when we go, it's sort of ethereal, it's, it's, that should be kind of a metaphoric term. And, and, and the cloud should really be understood like that. I mean, it's, it's just this kind of stuff that I think is quite, it's potentially dangerous, you know, that you actually forget that your iPhone was made in a sweatshop or, or is made of minerals that were dug up in mines and, you know, all of that sort of stuff that is, it's the remystification of experience. And I think that, that for me it's important to try in the work to retrieve a kind of imminence and a material and very Im embodied kind of um, presence, a here, you know, um, and to critique the, the fact that some of this technology uh, spirits things away, out of sight and, and out of mind, you know. It's interesting also the materiality then with Arkaf. The other day I spoke to the scientist George Church and he obviously talked about this idea of, of digital paranoia that it might all get lost at some point yeah. in some... Yeah. Uh, he calls it it's possible digital black hole and and George Church you know talked about this idea that actually the archive could be sort of DNA we could have sort of digital storage of, of, of through DNA and that would then have to be stored in yeah. sort of small glass particles yeah. and they could be even you know transported to other planets etc etc it sounded somehow science fiction but he's scientifically <laughs> working on it but he also Charles talked about sort of <coughs> the generative rather than the regenerative and that's something uh -huh. i was interested in relation to to you because yeah. the, you said that you use this technology because it offers you the possibility of nothing dying i found that in an interview that mm. it seems generative rather than regenerative well I, I, that's it's that's sort of true insofar as the interest in uh, in computer-generated stuff, is it's um, uh, the thing that I always found difficult was to point a camera at someone, and I think this is a very well-documented, discursive sort of terrain of like capturing someone, of t capturing someone's likenesses to sort of steal something of them, or is it, it's at least invasive? It has a kind of ethical terrain, and I certainly made lots of videos with the back of uh, people's heads in. Never, they would never turn around, you know, that I couldn't think of anything more opaque in the end than the back of a head. It which is so why we can't turn around here. Which is why, yes, <laughs> exactly. Somehow I can. I don't know what's happened to my head. <laughs> you're, you're, yours is constantly trying to run off to the other side. I'm sorry about that. But <laughs> no, yeah. it's fine. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's great. Um, what, what were we saying? Uh, uh, yes. So the generative. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. So the, the computer generated <laughs> thing, uh, basically that I didn't have to, uh, that something didn't have to exist that I would then capture and then use and then cut and edit and symbolically violate in various ways. So I could m build something from nothing, you know. Although obviously that nothing is just maybe another kind of material thing that's further deferred and is part of that problem. But um, definitely... I mean, at the beginning, there was, I, I remember talking to a friend, um, Ian White, who was talking about, he was saying, uh, maybe all of your work that you're trying to make, all the videos are just, you're trying to make dead men, which is a sort of strange thing to say. But that the idea of, and this was after um, this bit where, this, this essay by Blanchot, the two versions of the imaginary, where he's talking about the experience of seeing a cadaver. And, or being with a, a, a fresh, it's horrible to say, but a fresh cadaver, someone who's just died, and what that kind of, the experience of that might be, insofar as it, a, a cadaver oscillating between incredibly abject, imminent presence, it, like the heaviest thing you can sort of imagine, a dead body that cannot move. And then at the other end is, some, is the memorial, uh, ethereal thing that sort of, 
and that the cadaver oscillates between these things. But we occupy some other bit in between where we're, we're not, you know, that I'm not aware of my dead weight, thank God, you know, or whatever. Uh, where am I going? But, uh, um, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, but the, the CG thing, was I talking about the yeah, CG thing? Yeah, in relation to the generative and the regenerative. Thank you. Yeah, so trying to make dead bodies, that, that you might be trying to make effectively the same sensation with these videos as a person might have, with it, but without killing anyone. Mm -hmm. So if you, could, if you could make a dead body without someone having to die, what would it be? What, and that, that potentially, that threw a lot of convoluted nonsense in my head that, that was, that's an art object. You know, a dead body where no one had to die uh, and the effect is, I don't know, it, sort of, it doesn't really make any sense now. But, but thinking about computer-generated stuff, was, it sort of at least temporarily resolved the problem of having to kill people to film them. <laughs> <laughs> and the idea of, uh, of death is not only that the heads don't turn around, mm. but it's obviously also disembodied heads. And, uh, if I drink, it's quite... <laughs> have a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. And that's obviously something we're gonna have, we also have here upstairs. Very yeah. often the heads are disembodied. What, yes. How did this start? What was the epiphany of the disembodied head? Is there something also very recurrent? Absolutely. In your, in your well, it's a mixture of practical and, and aesthetic, as most of this stuff is, obviously. It's the kind of... So from this um, thinking about dead bodies and all of this stuff, it was a kind of, uh, and, and this sort of cumbersome word of cadaverousness, that there would be the, 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 that's the quality of an object that I would desire in some way, which is super morbid. But, so I'm burping now. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, uh, severed heads, yeah. I, and Chris Deva. Yeah, Chris Deva. I mean, you know, you, you, I'm sure you saw the, the show at the Louvre. Her sort yeah, of I went to see the exhibition. Book. She curated and the wonderful book. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, there's something extraordinary. The, the capital image, the iconicness of a severed head, that it shouldn't talk, that it is the thing. That's how you know someone's dead, is they don't have a head. So, uh, well, it's not the only way. <laughs> um, pulse. Uh, uh, but, <laughs> but it's also, it, like, it, there's a kind of absolute finality to it. So, to have a, a severed head talking is a kind of, is to speak about a perverse animation and a process of sort of some impossible thing happening there. But having said that, it's also super practical. So, this uh, bit of kit was the first thing that I uh, was used, an early version of it, f to make a, a piece called Us Dead Talk Love, which is two heads talking well, it's, it's sort of, it was going to be a conversation, but they kind of take it in turns to monologue. Um, and because I couldn't do anything else, this was the first foray into computer-generated stuff. I could do a bit of After Effects kind of things, but actually, uh, it's also that it's the face, isn't it? You know, it's that thing of all those years of making videos where no, there's no face, there's just the back of a head. So there's that sort of tension of resisting the face. And if the face... As soon as a face appears on a screen, it, there's a protagonist. There's a whole thing which actually folds and collapses sort of the idea of holding on to thinking about the structure of something, unless it's a computer-generated face. If it's a computer-generated face, you're so aware of its fallacy, of its artifice, that you can hold on to both the possibility of a kind of empathetic relation with this character and also that it's constructed, generated completely. So you could think about... You could hopefully think about the kind of discourse of, okay, this is, this is a computer-generated thing, so I can hold on. So it's not the idea of immersion. It's not that thing where you, you're supposed to forget the effect and just lose yourself to the thing. You can never lose yourself to the thing, and thank God you can't. Don't lose yourself to it, you know. But that it actually presents itself as a limit. Um, so anyway, the face of the severed head. I think it's all in there, what I just said. Maybe. And yeah. also, one of the things which is there from the very beginning is that you don't kind of make cinemas in exhibitions. It's kind of mm. modern cinemas. It's something which is obviously very strongly present here <coughs> in, the, in the display. But it's there from the very beginning of, uh, uh, of your work that you somehow um, bring in complexity. It's, it's, a, it's a gallery, it's a performance space, yeah. it's a theater space. It connects in different ways. Um, to the body and in a way when you speak with Adam Thurwell here in the publication 
Uh, you say that for you, the performance capture uh, here in Manchester is very much the continuation of the project at the Serpentine Sackler Gallery, where you basically further complicate something happened. I think it's the screensaver. I didn't turn it off. <laughs> There you are. Sorry. Yeah, but you basically um, already brought together in a Gesamtkunstwerk kind of way all these variety of art forms, the scripts, the drawings, the films, uh, the artist's book, uh, and of course also the voice, uh, yeah, you sure. as a singer. So I was kind of wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the Serpentine Sackler show, that idea of the Gesamtkunstwerk and how it then uh, further continued to the project here. Yeah, okay. So um, the, well, really the videos <coughs> for a while now have, uh, I've always wanted to push towards a lot of the kind of cinema, the promise of cinema, which is definitely one of, you know, the, and the, the economy of the cinema has kind of become strident again because of things like 3D and IMAX, which are all predicated on total immersion and kind of being bombarded by the world of the screen or let's bring the screen out and all of this kind of gimmickry that is, that is to save the economy of cinema from downloads and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so I kind of I want to be able to speak into that technology and into those kinds of experience, but also to make something more awkward, where you, you don't just sit in a chair and forget you have a body. You're you're kind of made to wander around, and actually the Sackler Gallery was sort of the perfect awkward space. You know, this thing that um, has is haunted by a kind of the spectre of its gunpowder uh, history of storing all that munition stuff, but also the kind of brick walls, those those amazing central spaces. Um, I have a problem here with periscope. Okay, but just continue. Down periscope, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, um, uh, and walk, basically wanting to make something that was uh, that you would walk around, that there was a loop, um, that there was a, a kind of looping <laughs> thing, um, uh, that the sound as well. The sound was a, is a big thing. Where am I going with this? Uh, that. Uh, the surround sound of the thing. I'm finding this distracting. Are you, are you, are you? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. Uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, you talked about the space Thanks. and yeah. the surrounding sound. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, of course, the, the haunting of the, the memory of this space, right. which was right. you know, a munition depot during the Napoleonic right. War. And then. Yes, OK, occupying the space, yeah. totally. But it's also, it's also the promise of the videos is that, that you could you know, for me, the interest was always that you could put everything into it, you know, that, that cinema has that kind of uh, inheritance of the Gesamtkunstwerk from opera. Um, uh, but, if, but if you could occupy space as well as just the flat screen by having people have to move around it, that it's a kind of in the round, totally in the round thing, then you've got, you can sort of bring back the physical aspect of uh, the opera in a way. Um, and then and add more, but it all, always, you know, that it kind of creates a slightly more awkward sensation because there's no definitive viewpoint, there's no safety of a seat. It's a bit more uncomfortable, which is something I like because it, it, it you know, it's what it's like. I only know I have a, a body if it goes a bit wrong. You know, I don't think about my legs until they go wrong. You know, that they kind of become manifest. They're returned to you in the point of kind of cramp or something, you know. And I think the, the thing of having to wander around a, a gallery um, and look for a chair and, and probably just sort of lean against the wall a bit and not really sure how to be that thing, um, yeah. And do you think, because Margaret Mead talks about the, uh, there's this great text by Margaret Mead, Dorothea von Handelmann wrote a new book which is uh, coming out soon about the, the idea of the exhibition as a ritual and she sort of revisits the anthropologist Margaret, I just r read uh, this recently about Margaret Mead's anthropology kind of of exhibitions and she talks to American anthropologists about this idea that on average we spend so little time in exhibitions because yeah. obviously exhibitions would only appeal to one sense mostly, to the visual sense, whilst on average people spend only a few seconds in front of an artwork and very often even if, you know, um, moving images installed, people just walk in and yeah. walk out and they don't spend time. And Margaret Mead says if you look at rituals, Balinese rituals, or even medieval masses, they kind of appeal to all the senses in a yeah. sort of Margis Amkutsa kind of way. And I was wondering um, yeah, that's good. if there's maybe a connection to that. Uh, yeah, that's absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm very aware of not being, a, um, you know, making, particularly making moving image work that goes in galleries. It's, yeah. That's that. You know, that's one of those things that people definitely march past and go, oh, you know, or like, how long is it? You know, really? 
Um, <laughs> so, the, so there was always an interest in making these things um, kind of thrilling and intoxicating, mm -hmm. you know. So the, I mean, upstairs is a, is a wholly different thing, but the, but the finished videos are things that I hope are kind of incessantly um, poking your attention. There's a kind of ADD sort of flicker to them. Um, because I, yeah, I mean, I have, I don't have, I'm not a hugely patient person. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, no, yeah, and I'm also, I forget, I like, like I keep talking now and I keep forgetting where I'm going at all. I'm sort of vertiginous nothing at the end of it. So I have to keep talking. This is again that logorrheic kind of whatever. Um, but, uh, where was I going? Hans, help well, we've me. got many more questions. Okay, and, thank uh, God, yeah. The more non-linear, the better. So basically, one thing which also in the transition, you know, from uh, what happened at the Southern Ensemble to, to the performance capture here was another kind of step was what you did with uh, 14 rooms, a project of course oh, yeah. which started here yeah, with 11 yeah. rooms in this very museum and then yeah. evolved and every year there is an additional uh, room and, and you, you did this avatar piece where the performative comes in. Yeah. It's a sort of long durational performance of eight hours which is improvised and uh, yeah. it's between sculpture and person and so for you it as you, you said, it was an opportunity to push the avatar thing. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the CGI figure and this performance? Because it's, I mean, here it's of course much more long duration because it's, it's the it's. entire festival. Yeah. So, uh, but well, it was this, it was, again, it was that thing of like, what if, what if this stuff had to be formed according to the, just to go back a tiny bit, and if I can hold on to this thought, is to do with mortality. Um, and just because I didn't get there about the regenerative versus the generative. But one of the things that I'm, I, I'm not at all interested in like some kind of immortal, uh, or like what you were saying about let's preserve uh, the DNA or sort of how to store oneself in some immortal form or something. I think one of the things that become increasingly important to me is to think about a kind of mortal and embodied sense of, and, and how riven the body is with uh, rehearsing that mortality. But also that that's the point, that's the kind of exciting uh, juxtaposition with the technology, which kind of carries on rapaciously tumbling around off its sort of obsolescent cliff all the time, just more, more, more promising things. And that cybernetics is this kind of, you know, it's not really adding metal to the body, it's about giving over bits of oneself to technology somehow. Hence giving up Instagram maybe and sort of <laughs> retrieving, relinking, right? Or delinking. Uh, now I've forgotten where I was going to no, go. But it's perfect because this is end of the prelude and now Thanks. we talk about performance capture. Yes, great, so okay. Chapter two, performance capture. Now the thing is, <laughs> it takes its name from a process that records, maps and renders the movements of a performer yes. onto a computer generated figure, an avatar that performs as the digital double of the performer. And it really started with the conversation we had, um, you, Alex Putz and I, yes. and then soon after also Maria Balcho about this yeah. idea, how could one actually make a group show, because obviously the idea is every festival to do a contemporary art group show in the context sure. of the festival, which explores different notions of performativity yeah. um, from Tempo de Postino ongoing. And uh, I remember your very first idea was actually that something which could be a solo show and a group show. And it uh -huh. addressed also, in a way, very much this, this, this issue, which of course a festival always has, because in um, the art world, we, we're always obsessed by books. Uh, yes. And I mean, there's barely an exhibition without a book. And it's, it's kind of a, um, uh, I mean, Anthony Powell said, books furnish a room. Lawrence Wiener quoted mm. him, books are so important. But in the context of festivals and of, sort of performance, there are much less books. And there hasn't really been a book on sure. a Manchester International Festival before. So the idea was also <coughs> how to document it. And it needed basically really an artist's vision, your vision to come up with this idea that it's, it's in a way capturing, of course, many, yeah. many dimensions of this festival. So can you tell us a little bit about the beginning, what sort of triggered it, what was your first thought? Because it came sure. up very quickly in that first conversation. Yeah, well, it was all there, really, was that I wanted to continue to sort of push this, this, the use of this technology. And I, for a long time, I've been thinking about, because I've only ever done it to myself, you know, I've only ever sort of sat in front of this tech myself and, and performed for myself in a spare bedroom, you know. And so, and because actually what it is to, to, again, to retrieve some of that conversation about an ethical thing, um, what it is to, to do this to someone else, to capture someone. I mean, in that word itself, there is a, there's a, 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 a latent 
sinister something about capturing someone. But having said that, there was this desire still to, to try and find the best way to allow myself to engage with that and maintain some kind of critical angle. And this thing presented itself, you know, was that, okay, it's a duration, it's a festival, it sort of has to engage with this, well, it doesn't have to, but really wonderful, it can engage with this sort of liveness and something changing and growing, something being born at this festival, you know, this figure occupied by, let's say, it can be performers from across the festival. And actually, maybe not just performers, but people from administrators to cleaners to volunteers to celebrities, but the whole a sort of uh, a cross-section of everything. Bec and actually that cross-section thing that it, that it wouldn't privilege anyone because in fact anyone who sits in front of this thing gets rooted through the same, you know, they get, they get funneled and, and um, <clears throat> homogenized and sort of and captured and then rendered. You know, and all this thing, this, and, and the, the technology is called performance capture, so it would be about performance figured to incorporate all aspects of life that actually we're never not performing. There isn't, it's not just like the theatrical or the cinema kind of performer, but, but actually that uh, I perform for myself, of course, you know. There isn't some authentic self that I can access. So to kind of literalize a lot of this and then maybe even make some sort of, some sort of satire, really. But at the same time, produce this really, really weird document of the festival featuring all these different people. And the script, of course, because there yeah. is always a script. It gets somehow, it's united or held together by um, the script. And I was kind of wondering if you can tell us about the story of uh, the script, because you, you say that uh, the, it's obviously connected <coughs> to um, this sort of polyphony of all these people being involved, but you also yeah. described it as a, as a poem, as a monologue. Yes. So um, to talk a little bit back about the poets that we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. um, they've really afforded me, um, I mean, at, at certain points, a wholesale kind of trying to borrow a style. But I feel like over the last couple of years, I've sort of found my own way to, to write. Um, but it's certainly one that's inflected by uh, a kind of demented uh, inability to make sense. But, but in that, the kind of owning of that is a kind of protest about coherence. So my partner Sally w wrote or began writing a PhD uh, about incoherence as a kind of, as potentially a kind of ethical way to approach other people. That that would be the only way to afford other people, to allow them their incoherence, to not try to make them cohere by understanding them. And, and as is my want, I tend to kind of push everything into some figurative place or try and find the right metaphor or the right, uh, or the right l way to perform that as a kind of pastiche or an allegory even, you know. So upstairs I kind of imagine this thing as, um, it's a factory, you know. It's a factory that of a, uh, that's needlessly imminent as a factory. Because actually, usually those kinds of processes are dispersed all over the globe. You know, if I capture this, I'd probably send it to be rendered in, I don't know, Sweden or something. And then it would come back and, and again, it's that kind of throwing away or, or losing sight of the material imminence of certain things. So having this thing all happen in one space, three rooms, that there's a render farm there. And again, this word render, um, which obviously has connotations, I mean, it's from you know, rendering bones and fat and flesh, um, and also rendition you know, uh, of people and the disappearing of people. Um, all of this stuff is amazingly present. And, so, and some people, someone decided at one point we would call this process rendering. Um, and we call it a farm. And so all of this sort of brutal, um, I mean, it's amazing. That's not my term, you know, that's obviously, that's not my term. But this stuff is, is laced with a, a, a figurative violence. And I think to, to get people to perform, and every single person gets, is, is homogenized into one white man. Do you know what I mean? You know, so everyone becomes uh, this white avatar, which, you know, if this was going to be a critique of a kind of high, late capitalist process and of one of insidious kind of politics, then the protagonist of that is a white man. That's the base level of identity right there that everyone else has to kind of agree with or go along with. So this, to sort of literalize this process that we might live socially, politically, to make it into a, a technical process and, and make, make those things sort of cohere as a, as, as a story of one another, an illustration or something. That was exciting. 
Having said that, it's, it is also this, this film, which will be a monologue delivered by, performed by 120 people. But the, the monologue as well, the text, you know, if you were a protagonist filled with 120 different identities, you'd be a bit sort of fragmented and schizo as well, I think, you know. So I think it was important that the, the text had this kind of anxiety of halting. There's so many ums and um, people searching to f try and remember dementia, you know. I mean, there's all that sort of Berardi stuff about possible symptoms of, of a life spent at computers in, in so-called um, immaterial labor conditions that actually symptoms of that would be depression, uh, alienation, um, uh, dementia, memory, problems with memory. You know, I forget, because I've given it all to a computer. <laughs> I can barely remember how to speak. <laughs> but also, the violence, you, there's a very interesting chapter here in your conversation with Adam Thurber where you say, and that's a notion you haven't mentioned yet in that list of, of notions which plays a role here, which is disabuse, because you say that basically um, disabuse uh, other people in the way that, I've always, that you've always disabused yourself. Yes. But obviously so far, you've always been your own <clears throat> guinea pig, in a yeah. way, for your own, for your own work. It's the first time that yeah. that changes. Can you talk a little bit about well, I don't, you what know. you meant by this notion yeah. of disabuse? Disabuse of, of what? Uh, well, I, I, I don't mind... Uh, I mean, I'm much more happy self-harming than harming someone else. You know, I don't mind that that would be... That's a condition of making the work and of trying to... You know, I'll do it. I'll use myself as the guinea pig. It's that sort of thing. Um, and obviously, there's a massive jump between doing that and doing it to someone else. Uh, particularly in the kind of general bonhomie of a festival where it's a... You know, it's great. People come along. It's a kind of... It's a temporary community. It feels nice up there. I really like it up there. There's a great vibe but there is still the, the desire to speak of these things. So it had to be the right conditions to, to disabuse other people of their, their identity, of their, of their discretion, of their singularity. So by making them read these bits of script, which no one can ever work out what on earth it's saying, you know, because one, it's just tiny fragments of this two hour long monologue, but also it's, it's written in this, in this broken, this, this kind of mess where almost the, the shape of grammar is still there, but the words are in the wrong place, and you can feel that they're, they're sort of yanked in that someone's just gone like that with all of language and memory and things. Um, but the, yeah, that, that, that was, it's, I'm still uncomfortable. I don't know where this is going, really, this, this work, because it's happening now. It's happening over the festival. And then I take the footage and I try and turn it into something else. But I, I, feel, I do feel a bit queasy every time... I make someone stand there and go through all the facial expressions that they need to I'm, do a 3D scan of their yeah, head, it's like which I did to you. Yeah, exactly. it felt like a message yeah. yeah, and there's some horrible phrenological bad science that's sort of haunting the whole thing, even if that's just the kind of the, uh, the haunting of an aesthetic which is now moved. Um, it's still there. You know, there's still this rather disgusting kind of... Uh, grasp, the, the, the grapple with the technology that's going to ascertain you, determine you, and concentrate you, render you, boil you down to some sort of horrible glue, and then paste you across Sky News or something. <laughs> and that's another thing in the <laughs> exhibition, because obviously yeah. there are these different rooms. There is the motion capture room, and yeah. then one has the second room with uh, the machines, so yes. to say, of uh, yeah. the machines, and at the same time there is also a TV, and there is a a David Cameron uh, yeah, sentence. Can moment. you tell us about that? How <laughs> that, that second room? Because it's a window. Yeah. Well, yes. Uh, it's, I, love, I love that room because it's, it's both the most intensely practical, as in everything that's in there, bar the drawings, and the TV, and the, quite a lot of it, actually. But, but a lot of it's intensely practical. It's just, yes, that's what it looks like. Yes, it, it looks like that. We've put a fan on it because it was overheating, you know, um, the, they don't have to be wearing this kind of casual fascistic uniforms, but it conjures something horrible, like a Gap store or a Mac Genius or something. Um, but uh, but the David Cameron thing, again, it was about... It's next to the TV. Thing. Yeah, so yeah. it's next to... It's Sky News 24 just showing all the time, which is, I thought of as a kind of, you know, like, here's a big... Here's everything uh, coming in, but everything mediated horribly biasly by the Murdoch world. 
Um, it's also just called Sky TV, which, you know, this is pushing it too far, but I always thought about it with the cloud as well. It was sort of this horrible sort of um, universal word. You know, the beauty of the sky was commandeered by them to, to describe the news, but it's not the news, it's political bias and horror. So representation in this situation, in the, in the show upstairs, is, is again figured in, all, in, all, in lots of different ways. So representation in terms of an image of someone, but also representation in terms of politics. And um, so in, the, in that little bit of text, um, which I can find in the thing, I think, somewhere in the, in the script. Um, this might take a long time. Then. No. We must say that the script has been printed and it's available for all of you to take it's in the exhibition. For, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot about Andy Serkis in here, because he's the sort of, he's the god of motion capture. Um, David Cameron, here, yeah. I've seen, returned in the autumn of the year to 3201 as a pretty, pretty, poorly darned comedy sock puppet embroidered with Esto Perpetua, which is the uh, Eton motto, uh, and only worked on the floor without any arm right up it, which what we all had a good laugh about, then went quiet, then sobbed and howled and wailed because David Cameron had returned and satire had just died, and we all felt incredibly sad, obviously. Um, so in that, in that thing was this kind of like, you know, this insufficient sock puppet that is actually David Cameron um, is a representation of... Anyway, it's sort of funny as well. But it was, it was like, you know, all of these bits of text, which I thought of as kind of like somewhere between museological information panels, which just burble kind of uh, desperate stuff at you. Um, they're actually lifted wholesale as a design from this show at the Musée d'Orsay, this uh, Marquis de Sade show. I don't know if you saw that. Yeah. It was an incredible thing. Um, but these quotes, they're always framed as quotes from sort of de Sade or Nietzsche or whoever, but uh, sort of laser etched out of bits of wood. Um, yeah, the, I, I always like that. It's the Mike Kelly thing as well, of the sort of quote, mm -hmm. this sort of horror of, of feeling the burden of uh, the, the, the sort of recited quote, the thing that's almost evacuated of all meaning by just being a quote or something, you know. And then from that, one goes into the third room and then yeah. there is a beginning <clears throat> of, the, of the projection. It's, of course, not yet no. the final result. No. Uh, far from that, because there will be an exhibition of these many, many hundreds of hours of, of footage which you will then edit. And yes. I think in February... Um, it comes the museum back here in February. ...come yeah. back to the museum. Yeah. But um, uh, can you tell us about what's happening in that third room? Because it's the beginning of this playing. Yeah, so the third room is, is the... the the accreting uh, rushes. So every time someone com comes in and they don the motion capture stuff, uh, which includes a, a sort of upper half bit, hands, gloves, has their face uh, captured and trained, and they perform a one minute chunk of this script, goes into the second room, uh, the information goes in there, and is applied to this singular avatar and rendered out, which can take up to sort of five hours, depending on how uh, intense the gesturing of the performer, um, and then that gets added to a, a, an ever-growing sequence uh, in order that is then shown in the third room. So at the moment, there's about 40 minutes of it so far. Which is, I think we're going a bit too quickly at the moment because I think it's only supposed to be two hours and we're not quite halfway. I don't know. But, um, but if you go in there, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it just has another one added every time someone comes through. Generally, I'm doing that at the end of the day because I, I have to kind of sequence it and stuff. But... But yeah, in the end, it's it's this it's a monologue for one for one avatar, but performed by 120 people. And how will you edit all of this material? Because it's interesting in terms of yeah. edit. Um, in previous conversations, you you talk about these drafts, and then it's edited again and again, and it's kind yeah. of a link to writing, no? Uh, and you talked a lot about Godard in, in previous conversations. We have um, the idea of the additive in Godard: yeah. this plus this equals this, and yeah. The equals this is either an effect, as you said, or it's the next scene itself. So it's like a chemistry. And you say Godard invents yeah. a kind of a new form of, of montage where the single segment is the only segment that exists. It's sort of parts become holes. Can you tell us a little bit about how you're going to edit it and if it will be a Godardian well, edit in that sense? That was always, I mean, to go back to that thing of that, the kind of faith in, like, if you could convene the right things, it's, which is vaguely alchemical, is the sort of uh, formula. If I put this with this and then pour this on it, 
then an explosion and then the monster comes to life or something, you know. Um, which is, I th you know, there's that, the Goddard thing does occasionally feel like that kind of clunk of like this and I'll just, then that, and then this will, this will appear or that will, and the, the, the thing that appears will hopefully be some sort of uh, unknowable beforehand effect, something that lands and, um, but in terms of this thing, to be honest, I don't, I don't really know because I'd quite like to, I mean, I might go the other way and sort of eliminate editing and try and have this uh, complete consistency of, of no cuts. Um, which will be hard, I think, because I've already started doing that. But I think, I don't know, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what happens in the background, um, the soundtrack, the foley, all of the stuff, the, the, the pleasure in, in fiddling and sort of attaching to things. Um, but, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I think I'm going to have to sort of change up so it's editing open. styles. Yeah, totally, totally open, yeah. A few more questions I had was, uh, I was curious about the costume, because you, you mentioned before the costume of cars, which uh, yeah. uh, everybody wears, who, who yeah. is motion captured. And uh, um, y you mentioned that these costumes actually are kind of redolent of the industrial military complex. They're yes. kind of black molded plastic. It's like, yeah, it's quite sort of military. It's like an yeah. armor, it's like a, yeah, a helmet. Well, I, I it's mean, also it, very much to do with, with surveillance, I suppose. Absolutely, the yeah. The whole idea of the filter bubble, no? Yeah, yeah, completely. I mean, I should say at this point as well that we, we had some very close calls and, and lots of big... We've had to jettison bits of technology which we, we started with, but which, you know, just days before the festival were just not delivering the kind of um, fluency that, that, that I was after. So we changed tack a bit. I mean, so the suit has changed. I mean, originally the thing that we had was this you know, uh, it's like a bike helmet with sort of arms coming off it and a, and a, and a little camera there, um, which is like sort of carrying your own CCTV thing around with you, that, but which just follows your face. Um, and really, really frightening thing. But, but yeah, it, it, everything looks like an armour. I mean, this is, the, this is the kind of, again, the, the aesthetics of this show, inclusive of the casual T-shirts and the, um, you know, the, the kind of halting piano music in there that sort of wafts around as a kind of waiting room. It's very, uh, it's very sanitized at one, at one level, but it's also, obviously we know that computer development, and software development, and a lot of this technology is funded and um, fed by military interest, but also massive corporate interest. Um, and then the, the prosumer sort of trickle down to a point where, oh, you know, we can afford that or use it. Um, and we can have fun with it, but that actually a lot of this stuff you can imagine already a, a thousand and one applications which are much worse. And I think that, that the, the design of things, the things that look like, uh, yeah, that it looks like, some of it looks like body armor, some of it looks like um, torture gear, some of it looks, you know, there's this weird paralleling of aesthetic, aesthetics which, which should tell us actually to be wary of, <laughs> of the, those cultures, even though they feel completely separate, that actually they're, they're, they're sharing in certain ways, or certain corporations are. Yeah, I mean, one of the big things for me was that this is a, apparently a behind the scenes, right? You know, this is a kind of uh, access all areas, come and see the production of this thing, which kind of the rhetoric of that speaks to, you know, um, that I will learn something, that I will find out the truth behind the curtain. I'll see the wizard and he'll be this. And actually, it, like in The Wizard of Oz, the only thing that sort of reveals is a kind of pathos, is a kind of, you know, it's like, it's like seeing Andy Serkis in, in emerald spandex, you know, jumping around bits of polystyrene. You just think, that's sort of, it's a bit embarrassing. Um, but but, but and that, that, that's a kind of truth, that the truth would be sad and embarrassing. Um, but obviously, actually, what's happening upstairs and a lot of that time is the kind of reiteration of spectacle rather than the, the pulling back and finding some sort of beating heart, the truth of the thing, that actually we're still left with the complete, not a complete, but a, a, a huge amount of ignorance around the way the technology functions, how it functions like that, you know, the, the kind of hermeticism of this stuff, which again is, relates to the, the, its movement further and further into 
uh, into a kind of mystification. So there's of a mystery what it is. there, and that's actually kind of interesting because I didn't now I understand, but I didn't understand when you when you mentioned that because there's in, in a conversation with Kai Sherwin you said that yeah. it's a bit like the DVD bonus thing, no? Yeah. Where <laughs> you know, in a way, um, you're supposed to learn more, but it's kind of mystifying of yeah. the process. Yeah. Well, or just uh, horrendously confusing because mm -hmm. actually it still manages to circumnavigate showing you because obviously there's no way of showing you how the tech works. So what is it, how do, how do we sort of reclaim understanding or, uh, or, or get rid of some of that sensation of ignorance, of really just like letting it happen um, and just going, and I think one of the ways is, is to speak of bodies and, uh, and experience, you know, that this stuff, you know, to, to sort of uh, never, not, not apologize for the failure of experience, but to kind of Go for it, you know. That could almost be a great conclusion. I have, however, two last questions. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. One is because we have these two things we omitted, which is which are kind of important because we've talked a lot about the digital, but there's obviously also this whole analog part. There are these uh, very analog drawings, these yeah. boards, and uh, uh, they, of course, talk about bodies as well. Can you tell us about the presence of those in the, yeah. in the exhibition? They've, I mean, those big sort of eight-foot standard sheets of MDF. Uh, I've been I've been doing them for quite a while, and. As ever, they, they're sort of, they're part of the ritual of making a, an exhibition, that they kind of, they, they speak of a very different kind of uh, material and artistic kind of presence in a way. The hand of the artist or something, you know, the kind of bollocks of that thing. But also the, uh, that it's sort of, um, uh, they, yeah, they're super analog things, that, they, they, that there would be big drawings here. But they're also a bit like stage flats, you know, they're kind of, they have that, you could just imagine sort of lugging one around and putting it there and then you would have, you know, and, they're, and, and obviously all the images on them are, are kind of, again, super graphic kind of uh, contorted hands and splattering bits that are, again, re sort of representations of gr gratuitous bodily stuff, you know. Yeah, it was interesting um, during the Insta because they kind of got moved around and some yeah. ended backstage and yes, some... Yes, exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then, and then actually hanging these sort of perspex faux quotes on them, yeah. um, that they'd almost be like, okay, is that an illustration of that? You know, and you think, mm, certainly not, you know. <laughs> but, that they, that, but that you sort of tease sensation out of them or something, you know. And then there is another mysterious thing, um, and that's the kind of last question, because very often, I mean, already in your earlier films, there were these citations and these footnotes which appear, and you used kind of references uh, also from the past, I mean, there was the drunk fawn from the Glyptothek, or yes. um, the Medusa from Leptis Magna, etc. And here in Manchester, it's, it's, it's Oliver. Oliver Cromwell, yeah. yes. Can you tell <laughs> us about Oliver? Well, I brought him as a postcard with me, uh, his death mask. It's a really great... Um, well, his death mask is great, and his head was amazing, you know, it was huge. He had a huge head. <laughs> um, so, and when he was, you know, executed, death mask made, and I have this postcard that, uh, I'm not sure where it's from actually, maybe it's the Ashmolean, I don't know. Harry's nodding. Yeah, the Ashmolean. Um, uh, yeah, and so I brought it in. It's also, you know, so when you do this facial capture thing, and maybe I can just show a bit of this actually, this would be more uh, appropriate here. Um, this thing. Um, yeah, in the training section, what you do is you, you make these sort of 3D, that's me wearing headphones, it's not my ears. Um, <laughs> but, but it looks like a sort of, you know, plaster of Paris death mask, which weirdly, you know, I made two films called Death Mask 2 and 3, which were sort of begun thinking about Madame Tussaud and representation, the only way you could become a representation of yourself was to die and all of this morbid stuff. Um, but yeah, and these are the expressions you have to go through. So when after this, I'm sure some of you have been upstairs, but uh, every new performer has to go through, I think we're going to do you again as well upstairs, um, is you have to go through these sort of extremes of expression to train it uh, about where your face will go. But you also end up with these, yeah, these kind of rather calm death mask things on the right, yeah. Ed, thank you so, so much. Oh, thank you pleasure. very much. Yeah. Thanks thank a you. lot. Thank you.
Yeah, it's true, yeah, yeah. And we can now open it up to questions from you, if there are questions for Ed. A question here. Do we need a mic or without mic? If you could repeat the question afterwards so that the live yeah. web stream can get So there's been a lot of stuff recently about hands and gestures in, in the literature, and I just wondered whether you're rendering faces, but the gestures may render as well. We've got a, a sign in here today. So, well, actually, upstairs, we've only got this here because it's the, the portable bit of it. But upstairs, <laughs> uh, people have to don a suit, and it's actually the hands and, that are absolutely part of it. So it's, it's really, we're only getting head, neck, uh, arms, and hands, as in the kind of, you know, the, the most intense, concentrated bits of expression, I think. I mean, this is amazing. This is wonderful. Um, and actually, <laughs> sorry. but I think, I think, I mean, maybe we could capture you upstairs. That would be great. <laughs> Just because actually, because the, the detail of the, the finger joints and stuff is, uh, that's, that's one of the things we're sort of super proud of is that we have these gloves which have a sensor on every single joint. So you can really, uh, yeah, yeah, but abs absolutely. What was the literature that you're thinking of with? with oh, right, and yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's, I mean, it's, you know, we think of like um, touch, touch tech or whatever, you know, the kind of swipe, this new lexicon of gestures about poking and zooming and all of this stuff and these sort of now urban legends of sort of, you know, young toddlers sort of doing that on a window or something, you know, trying to zoom in the world and, uh, yeah, totally, yeah. Yeah. Are there other questions? Yes. There's a question here. So, so you kind of captured the whole test, but it's part of the test, but I'm sure the audience. So did you think you could do that with the public? At some point, but, it, but we really, it's just about time, really, is that there's only really seven slots we can do a day, because it, um, even though it's only a one-minute performance, the render time and the amount of cleanup that, that the amazing technicians from Studio District have to do in the second room means that we're so limited. Um, it would have been amazing to have a kind of constant flow of visitors being able to do it as well, but we just, just couldn't. So we had to focus on people who were uh, working within the festival. Yeah. Are there other questions? Maybe a last question about the book. Can we have a look at oh the yeah. book? Because you very often, I mean, books are important for you, and you, you yeah. often do, uh, for each exhibition, a kind of an artist book. And here it includes not only the script and the conversation mm. with Adam, but also uh, a lot of drawings. Can you tell us a little bit about, about the publication? And I'm just going to shift to um, yeah. this guy instead. Uh, <coughs> could you say that again? I was just thinking about the bald man. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> no, no, the book, the, the, the thing, because the, the only thing we haven't uh, you know, addressed is the, is the book, and for yes. every exhibition, yeah. the book is never kind of a, a secondary thing, but very often there are artist books who are very involved in the design of the book, and yeah, uh, totally. here it is a script, which is illustrated by your drawings, the conversation with Adam. Can you tell us a little bit about, about this book? Yeah, it's, I, I, I don't want to let go of it. You know, I really like, uh, uh, I think even the discourse around, you know, which is sort of, nonsense about like uh, I can't read on a Kindle I like the smell of a book or, or all of that sort of stuff which is kind of I mean it's great but it's also like so in a way there's the kind of cheap kind of idea of holding on to the material thing in the face of encroaching dematerialization or something but really it's it's much more fetishy than it's just like books you know and I like um, and I, I, I enjoy writing so much and I love all of that stuff so much that I I would be at pains to ever give that bit up, really, I think. And the com it was amazing to talk to Adam, who's you know, a, a very well-known and, and amazing novelist. Um, and his, what's great about, he came at it all from a complete, just literature, was like, you know, he came to the Serpentine thing and read that little book and was sort of, okay, let's talk, we can talk about literature. I didn't realize we could, you know. And it's great. It's, I mean, in the end, I'd love to publish something, some written thing that, that didn't require art as the kind of condition of its conjuring. Because sometimes that feels like a sort of caveat, you know, like, oh, it's art writing, right? Okay, yeah. It can be shit then. Or, or <laughs> um, 
Uh, but yeah, yeah. So this is the moment to thank again, uh, thank you all, to thank, thank again Alex, coming, to thank yeah. again also Marianne. We would like to also uh, very specially thank our dear friend Peter Saville. Um, uh, Peter Saville, who is my fellow MIF artistic advisor, who of course helped determine that the festival should be dedicated to new works uh, such as performance uh, capture. And I wanted to read you here <laughs> an SMS Peter uh, showed me the other day, which uh, actually, and maybe through this, dedicate also this conversation to the memory of the great Tony Wilson, without whom many, many things here in Manchester wouldn't have happened. Uh, and Tony Wilson sent this wonderful SMS uh, to Peter Saville. Sorry to leave early. It was like your original modern first time round. Genius makes me cry. God, they are good. And as for you, well, we know about that. Thank you all so much, and thanks, Peter. <laughs> and thanks to Ed. Thanks to Ed. Thank you. Thank you. Right.